And we are live. Welcome, everybody. This is Zero Prep Gun Fun, and I'm Johnny from 180 Second Ideas. The guest today, or our guest today, is Ryan Kleck. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him in just a moment, but Ryan, how's it going? Welcome. I am so excited to be on 180 Second Ideas, man. You are someone I look forward to seeing every single week. I mean that. So just being here is super cool. Well, man, I really appreciate it. I now I know most a lot of folks know who you are, and we've been talking with a couple people. I've been talking with several people over the last couple of weeks. Just I knew you were going to be coming on, and, and a lot of folks know exactly who you are. But let me just kind of just fill in. I know it's a really big and a broad career, but if I miss anything, you can let me know. Um, you are uh, a career sniper, like you've been in special forces, a special forces sniper. You're currently an author and an attorney. You are a lecturer in constitutional law, and you're the owner and the founder of Rocket FFL, plus a whole lot of other stuff. What did I miss, Ryan? Too many other things. I'm, I'm way too busy. I do two different podcasts. I try and keep some videos going. Uh, new videos are coming out with the NSSF right now for instructional. I do, uh, I do Rocket CCW. I like the Rocket name so much. I made an online way to get your CCW so you don't have to go sit through eight hours if you don't want to. I just released Mayday Safety yesterday. That's a whole app and uh, organizational family preparedness for emergencies. I, I need to slow down, man. Well, I like it. I did not know that. I know you did Rocket FFL, and I'm working through my uh, Rocket FFL process right now. Good. And then a buddy of mine texted me this morning. He said, man, he's working on his too. And then uh, we get that reminder every Sunday saying, hey, loser, you're a little behind on your uh, progress. So I appreciate that. But I didn't know about the Rocket CCW. So you're helping folks out and how to get their CCW. How many states are you working in? Well, so... I, I was a little conflicted about doing it, honestly, because one of my big things I like to harp on is training. So I get asked all the time, what gun do I get? What ammo do I buy? What scope? What this and that? And honestly, good enough equipment in the hands of somebody that knows what they're doing is going to way better and way safer than the best equipment and not knowing what you're doing. So I'm all about training. So my dilemma was, I want to offer an easier way to get CCW training when you move, because I moved quite a bit. I was a uh, for years there, I was a vice president at Remington Outdoor Company. So I was traveling all over the place. And when I go to a new state and I need to get the CCW, I had to go sit through an eight or a 16 hour class again, hearing which end of the gun is the noisy end. And I'm not saying that's bad training. That's great training for people to get. But I was at a point where I would have rather had a streamlined process. And I found out that there's a state out there, you can get a non-resident permit and it works in over half the country and I can get it to people in 20 minutes. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to make that into a business. And I did, and it's working. And Rocket CCW is born. Now, for those of y'all that maybe this is your very first time, this is called Zero Prep, and there is almost Zero Prep. Now, I'll be honest. I did cheat today, and I jumped over it, and I did read Ryan's bio. I felt like I was a big cheater. But there is nothing that really off limits. There's no prep. There's no plan. We'll just see what happens. Now, we got a lot of folks in the chat room right now. we got 48 already, and I suspect there'll be some more rolling in. So a big hello to everybody in the chat room. If you have questions, for Ryan Kleckner, Special Forces Sniper, or any of the other parts of his career, man, holler at him down there, and uh, we're going to answer some of those as we go along. Ryan, what you carrying today? I actually am carrying on the desk in front of me, because I don't like carrying when I'm sitting down. I carry a CZ P10C. I love this thing. I've been a Glock guy for a long time, and I tried one of these out. CZ gave a nice demo to try out, and I've fallen in love. This thing's awesome. Well, very nice. That's kind of funny. And we did not plan this, but I pulled out uh, mine for the day. Actually, I was cleaning and it's still <laughs> sitting here on the bench. CZ75B, it's the classic. You know, one of the things that I like, Ryan, is if I'm going to own a CZ, I want to start with a CZ75. If I'm going to own a Beretta, I am going to start with a 92FS. And I think there's just something about owning the very base model, right. the, very, the, the standard of anything. What do you think about that? I agree with you. And I think those are great guns. I mean, it... It doesn't have to be the newest, sexiest thing to work for you. And I think those CZs or CZs, before someone corrects me, uh, depending on where, where you're from, are amazing, amazing workhorse guns. I think they're great. I like the SP-101s a little bit better than the 75, but mm -hmm. if you're going with the original, got to go with the 75. There's a lot of folks already rolling in here to the chat room. Again, a big hey to all those folks. We have got some, uh, just some viewers, some good guys or some really active guys that shoot a lot. I know a lot of y'all and we've got some doggone celebrities in there. A big hey to the Gun Collective. Several of their team members are in here and there's a lot of folks in here that I do recognize. So sound off in the comment section 
if you've got anything or in the chat room, if you have any questions and I'm going to ask a couple questions to, to Ryan and say, now some people may not know this. Ryan's also an author. And I mentioned that just a minute ago, he has a best selling book in its category. It is number one on Amazon for a long period of time. And the title is long range shooting handbook. And the subtitle is the beginner's guide to precision shooting. So it's a beginner's guide for precision shooting. Number one in its category on Amazon, Ryan, what's something that maybe shooters like me, I shoot holes in pizza boxes. I'm a tactical dad. I have never done a one mile shot, but I do want to get better. What's something that the average shooter can do uh, maybe to get a little bit better in our day-to-day -day shooting? Dry practice or dry fire. I like calling it dry practice, but spend time getting used to your, you were talking rifle here for example, we're talking long range shooting. Um, first off, thanks for plugging the book. I appreciate it. If I had known it was going to sell so well, I would have written it better. That's I, my, my joke is, <laughs> I need to use the spell check. <laughs> I, well, I wrote it cause I wanted to write a book. Cause I thought that was neat to say that you've had written a book and yeah, it's been over two years now and I'm, oh, well, maybe, maybe that's the way to go. But the advice I get from the entire book or the way I teach for the, the videos I have online is that it's not as complicated as people try to make it seem. And for some reason, long range shooting is obviously very popular, but for some reason people try to overcomplicate it. And I don't know if that's their way of showing off of like how cool they are. And therefore look at me, I understand all this complicated stuff, or if they're trying to protect their little group and keep you out of it, but it's not that hard. It's all about the fundamentals. And Johnny, if you just went out there with a rifle, even at home in your shop right there and took the time every day to dry practice over and over and over, you're going to become a better shooter. Let me ask you this. Um, you mentioned trigger. What's a trigger that stands out to you in the industry right now? What do you like? For bolt guns, trigger tech. They are amazing. Uh, I've, I actually start working with them a little bit and help everyone start with importing some things. They're from Canada, but they are came out of nowhere. They made crossbow triggers. And every single person that is a trigger snob, kind of like I am, that feels the trigger, swears the poundage is lighter than it really is. And I don't like that light of a trigger. But every time they feel it, they're like, oh, wow, that, that must be at this weight. And I know, nope, pull out a trigger scale and show them. They're just amazing, amazing triggers. For ARs, I'm a Geisley nut. I love Geisley triggers. I, I think they're the way to go. And I think Bill Geisley is just one of the neatest people around. So whatever I can do to, to support him and the good triggers out there. Yeah, and I really agree. I have a Geisley in one of my ARs and I've got one of their, maybe one of their step down on their platforms, the ALG triggers. And I've got another Geisley that's still in the package, if you can believe that. A lot going on in the chat room. Mark from Fit and Fire, a lot of y'all know his channel. He just asked this question. But before I answer this question, or I ask you to answer this question. Mark, today is Mark from Fit and Fire's 40th birthday. So in the chat room, if y'all want to say hey to Mark, happy 40th birthday. Welcome to the club, Mark. You are now 40. But Mark says this, Ryan. He says, hey, Ryan, what is your favorite platform to begin precision shooting? So Mark, happy birthday. That's a great question, but it's hard to answer because it's like saying, what's your favorite car? Um, I think if people spent a moderate amount on a rifle, maybe around $1,000, maybe the Ruger Precision Rifle, uh, maybe one of the Tikas. I'm a real big fan of those. Uh, even some of the Remingtons and Savages are fine. Getting a scope at about twelve to $1,400. So you can get a Ruger Precision Rifle and a Vortex Viper PST. And not only will they be affordable, but they'll be able to keep you entertained for years as you learn how to shoot. I used to always tell people to start with 308 because 308 was so available. Everybody understood how it shot. You could find data everywhere. But 6.5 Creedmoor has way beyond taking over the market. You might as well start there. The ammo is available. It's low recoil. It's, it's easy to shoot. A couple more coming in here. What is your preferred? I like this question. John Wesley says this. What is your preferred off the shelf bolt action brand? Oh, Tika. They're amazing. They, you, they, I don't think you can find guns that'll shoot better than a Tika off the shelf for a production gun. You know, so even their high end, uh, tactical a one with the cool chassis and all that, I think retails at $1,500 and it punches way above its class. If you see the most recent video I did with the NSSF, that's with a Tika, a brand new out of the box. And even when I'm making mistakes and on live recorded, if that makes sense, shots and then showing the mistakes I made, we're still shooting half minute groups. They're amazing guns. One more from the chat room. MW Tactical says, hey, Ryan, what is your preferred long distance caliber? Ugh, I guess define long distance. Uh, I'm going over to 6.5 now. 
Up until last year, I would have said 308. And even though it's a dog on the ballistic charts and everything else can beat it, it's just what I'm used to. When I look at wind at distance, I see it in 308 wind. And then I have to convert in my head to get over to a new caliber. It's kind of like your native language, always having to think of that first and then converting over. That's what I, I've had to do forever. But now that 6.5, again, is so cheap and available and awesome, uh, it's probably going to be 6.5. I have a Tika coming, by the way. I ordered it in 6.5. I think at, at my ripe age, Ryan, I'm, I'm nearly 44. I'll be 44 here in a few weeks. I think the older I get, it's okay to be good at something. Like the older I get, the more I know I'm good at this and I'm bad at this. You know, when we were younger, you would, you know, somebody says, hey, you're really good at that. You say, oh, no, no. And you try to be humble. But I'm just going to throw this out there. You have literally written the textbook on uh, how to do long range shooting. Mm -hmm. and you're doggone good at it and there's no way i mean there's that's just the way it is there's things i'm really good at i can make regular situations really awkward it's what i do good yeah it, it is and but let me ask you this when did you know you were good was there a moment was there a shot that you took when did you figure out hey i'm maybe probably better than most or average shooters it's not as exciting as you might think sorry it's when i was getting paid for it there was actually a day I'm, I'm, I'm in the military. I grew up in a, in a hunting family. We shot guns. We, we were always in the outdoors. We did things like that. And it was actually one, two times. The first time was I was in the middle of Sodic, which is the premier special operations sniper school. And that, a couple month long course, I'm in the middle of that and we're having fun and nobody's stressed or angry or mad. And we're getting just amazing shooting instruction. And I stopped and I looked around the range just of the legends that I was around. You know, I was the small fish in this big pond as I was starting out. And I realized I'm getting paid to be here. Like, this is actually my job. I'm a special operations sniper. This is kind of cool. And that's when I started realizing, well, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for X, Y, and Z. And I started putting it together in my head. And I think the second time was when I left and I started teaching more. I started teaching a lot of military and police snipers. And just every day being able to see them improve and get better, I went home one night and realized, wow, I'm helping them. You know, they were the guys that when I was younger or somewhere else that I would think, oh, that police sniper, he's the, he's the best one ever. And it was just, I don't know, need to realize that. What's an area in the gun industry that you, or maybe in your own personal shooting that you struggle in? What's something that doesn't come easy to you? Handgun. Handgun takes a lot of practice. I've shot a lot of IPSC. I, uh, I don't really like IDPA myself. I like three gun and I'm decent with the handgun, but I have to work so much harder with a handgun to get near what I can do with a rifle. What's wrong with the industry today? Ugh. Reinventing the same thing over and over in a new color and calling it innovation. John Patton over at the gun collective on his uh, TGC news on Monday night, he said he was talking about innovate or die that you've got to innovate. Mm -hmm. If you, and you have been an industry executive, you were a VP mm -hmm. at Remington for a long, long time. If you were handed, maybe not crazy money, but re realistic budget, and a realistic R and D team or whatever it is that you need, what would you innovate? Caseless ammunition. We're using Can the same cartridges that cowboys are using. Cowboys were using a brass cartridge with a primer and gunpowder and a lead bullet. And you know what we're using today in like the newer, more advanced guns, the exact same thing. Um, at least I would try to do caseless ammunition. And if I failed, I could cross that off a list of things not to do. But I think that for all the focus we put on guns, we don't put enough focus on the fuel that runs them. I think ammunition is where it's at. You're a professional in the gun industry. I know there's a lot of guys that would give their left pinky toe to be a professional in the industry. And I know it's a job just like any other job, mm -hmm. but this is your job and you're getting to do stuff that a lot of folks would really like to do. Do you still like guns? I love guns. I don't get to shoot near as much as I'd like to, but I love guns. And the second I stop loving guns, I'll do something else. What's your guilty pleasure gun? Because I'll, I'll give you mine. I, I kind of like shooting the high point. It's kind of fun. I feel mischievous whenever I'm shooting it. So what's your guilty pleasure? Ooh, I, I don't know if it's guilty. I love shooting 22. So I, I, I giggle the most when I'm shooting a 1022 probably. Um, I get picked on a lot for this one. I have a uh, Tavor there on the wall, leaning up against the wall behind me. I used to pick on those things because they looked like a Starship Troopers gun. And the more I've spent time with it, the more I love it. And I, the only reason I won't take it sometimes is I have to spend so much time defending it at the range to explain to people why I like it. So maybe, maybe that one. 
I have never owned a Tavor, but I am an IWI nut. I mean, and here we go. I, I won't go too far into it. A lot of folks mm-hmm. in the chat room know this. I am nutso about the Jericho. So yeah, to, yeah. you are uh, you are speaking my language. Let's head back over to the chat room. Uh, Chris says this. Please ask Ryan, what does he think of the Accuracy International AW308? Oddly specific question. Uh, great guns. I don't think that they are what they used to be. Not that the gun is any worse, but the rest of the industry is caught up. So in 2000, 2001, the Accuracy Internationals were the sexiest, greatest guns going. And now I think compared to the other guns, they're a little expensive, a little heavy, um, not quite as user-friendly as some of the other guns. Me personally, I don't like a thumb hole stock. I think a thumb hole stock or even the pistol grips that you see on chassis today, like the AR style pistol grips, I think are bad for the industry. I don't think they make shooters better. I think they make shooters worse. I'm obviously in the minority because everyone keeps doing them. Um, but I like more of a traditional stock style. And now if I had the same money to put into a gun, I would consider getting like a Socko a TRG-22 in 308 or something like that. Hunting Dad 74 says, hey, Ryan, what is your preferred optic? Now, I know that's a big question, but that is what he asked. My favorite scope is a Vortex Razor Gen 2. They are pricey, but I think... My experience, my opinion, they are the best scope available, not just for the money. They're amazing. But Leupold makes some amazing scopes too. Uh, those are my favorite. I was not in the military, Ryan. I, you know, I now looking back, I know I would probably have never passed a physical. My back, you can see my back is all sorts of curved up, or I'm on a slant because I'm uh, I've got style. But I didn't serve. And for me, looking in, I'm really interested in the military. I read a ton of military books, and I mean, I've read them all. Uh, what is something maybe in your career that you can look at? And when you look at media, because I watch a lot of movies as well. Is there a movie, you know, you've been through your career, you've been through the military, you're very connected to the military. Is there a movie out there that got it right in your opinion? No, (laughs) there's, there's my anticlimactic answer. I'm sorry. So this is one of those things that I had so many people asking me when, uh, it was a shooter came out. was the movie was a Chris Kyle movie. It had been out for a while and I hadn't seen it. And everyone was asking me over and over and over. And I had to keep saying, no, I haven't seen it. And they'd ask why. I said, look, if you were a plumber and they made a movie about plumbers, would you go watch the movie? No, you wouldn't. Because either one, it's not going to entertain you because it's some, everything you know. Or two, and way more likely, they're going to get everything so wrong that it's going to drive you nuts. I ended up seeing it anyway, but no. American I, Sniper. Is that what it was? Yeah. Well, American Sniper yeah, was American the one Sniper. Was a shooter. And then yeah. Shooter yeah. is the other long distance movie starring Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Uh, I was thinking American Sniper. But They're both yeah, sniper so movies. They all, get, they all get it wrong, but it's a movie. And here's what people need to remember. Whatever industry you're in, whatever you're into, at least once the news or some Discovery Channel show or something has taken a dive into your world, if even maybe even for a 15-minute segment, Remember that and remember how frustrated you were that they got everything wrong, including the diagrams and the descriptions, and then apply that to everything else you learned from that History Channel show. Is They didn't just accidentally get the industry that you know wrong. They get it all wrong, but they're trying to make a story. I get it. I see your book over your shoulder, I, and I've not read your book. I've never even seen one of your books in person. I did put what? a link down in the description uh, over to Amazon if po- folks do want to check that out. Uh, what is the average shooter like me, a pizza box so- uh, soccer dad, going to get out of that book? You are going to get out of it that it's simple. It's more of a motivational book, as I was, <laughs> as I was thinking what I was going to say. You can do it. It's not that hard. It's all about the fundamentals. You need to learn some of the lingo and some of the math first. You know, So there's... The beginning of the book is the first third I call it the what is it first third. And then the middle is how it works and then how to use it. So the middle section, you're going to learn a lot about minutes of angle and mills and angular deviation and what the humidity does and things that might make your eyes cross a little bit that you might need to read a couple times. But then you're going to learn some practical application in the end. And people that get that book, I mean, I put it there for shameless plugs. So you guys can see it. Yeah, I did orange on purpose too, so it stands <laughs> out. Um That book, when I say it was more than I expected, we're at 40,000 copies now. And the people that write in, write in thanking me that they were able to get out to the range and shoot a target and have fun and go home. So that's it. It's not going to make you the new Chris Kyle, but it is going to teach you your way around a rifle and it's going to teach you a way to enjoy shooting at the range. 
John Patton just asked this in the chat room, and I know he asked it tongue in cheek. He said, someone needs to make a movie about being a gun channel guy on YouTube. Hashtag most boring movie ever. However, <laughs> I do have uh, something I was thinking about today while I was driving before I got to talk to you. You're in the gun industry. What is your day-to-day -day life like? Is there anything that is just doggone cool, a meeting you go to that you've been to recently where you sit and you go, pinch me, I am in the middle of this and it's awesome. Yes. Yes. It, it is awesome. And first off, he's right about the hashtag. That's funny. And I think that's why the military movies get it wrong, by the way, is being a sniper is the most over romanticized job out there. It's actually a horrible, boring, tough job that wouldn't be entertaining in a movie. But for me, it's the people I get to meet. I mean, uh, I was over at Kyle Lamb's house a few weeks ago. I remember looking around his office going, this is Kyle Lamb's house. I'm sitting here talking to Kyle Lamb. This is so cool. Uh, it's gotten a little past that now for me, but years ago at SHOT Show when I'd get to meet some of the people or I'd be in meetings with the ATF, I'd be sitting there in Washington, D.C., you know, talking to the director of the ATF. That was kind of cool, you know, things like that. And now I just realize that we're all just people and it, it's fun seeing everybody. Um, my day-to-day -day is I write. I'm answering emails like crazy. I'm trying to make new products. I'm trying to go out and shoot and try things. It really is. It's a dream. I'm so thankful I get to do what I do. You're also a content creator. You're an active podcaster and you're doing a few of the things like me. I know you're trying to keep up with my career here in my shop, but you know, one of the things about being a content creator is you interact with the public. What's uh, maybe one of the worst or least favorite comments you've gotten back from a listener or a viewer or one of your readers? Hmm. There's a lot of them. I, I used to care more. That was one of the things I had to learn how to do. So if you're gonna be a content creator, I had to learn what Johnny already knows how to do, which is just... <laughs> It's someone on the internet in someone's basement trying to be, you know, crappy. I've been very, very fortunate so far with mostly good comments. I don't know. People come out there, um, just say something's wrong or that I'm incorrect about something that's actually provable. That probably bothers me the most. You know, when I try and explain a concept about what humidity does and someone comes out and, well, actually you, da, 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 and they'll type in a huge paragraph. That bothers me more than just, I hate you. If someone said, you suck. Okay, great. But when it's, when it's the, when they're trying to nitpick something that's not nitpickable, the earth is actually flat. What are you talking about? The curve of the earth. I will get those comments. Yeah. I think if you put as an adult, if you put the word actually in the opening to any other adult, you're already done. You have become actually. what's called that guy. <laughs> actually, actually sniper Raya. Let me tell you how it really is. Yeah. How about a fan interaction in person? You ever been recognized in a bizarre place? I have. Yeah. I actually, uh, I forget what I was buying now, man. It was Home Depot and I was either paint for targets or stapler for targets, something that had to do with targets or shooting. And I was checking out the guy made a comment like, oh, I know what those are for. Or I know what that's for. And I went, oh yeah, <laughs> just kind of in passing, not really paying much attention. He said, go into the range. And I looked up against it. Yeah. How, how would you make the connection into the range? He goes, he gave me a wink and kind of annoying. I know who you are. I'm like, oh, cool. That kind of made my day and creeped me out a little bit too. I like it. I think it's pretty cool. How about a shot that you have made that you're able to talk about that you were pretty proud of? Uh, the, have you ever seen the one on YouTube with the Barrett uh, 50? Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's the that's luckiest shot I've ever made. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, the hardest part about doing that, Johnny was walking away. Like I meant to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody has seen that shot. Yeah. So I, I picked it up. I even say to the camera, I'm not going to hit the target, but we'll try. And so I used to shoot a lot standing when I was in the military, just goofing around, but I'm a little less in shape than I used to be then. And I remember picking it up and you're holding a 30 something pound rifle by the magazine, you know, trying to hold it stable. And I remember trying to get it stable on the target. And all I saw was a thousand yard berm in the scope, just go <laughs> flying by and then <laughs> flying by again. I was like, Oh my gosh. All right. Next time I see the target, I'm just going to mash the crap out of the trigger and hit it. And as I recoil, I'm setting the rifle down and everyone goes crazy. I had to walk away and go, yep, yep, meant to do that. And of course, I get asked all the time to do it again. And you know what my answer is, right? No. <laughs> no way am I ever going to try that again. Cool so guys, walk away yeah. from the fire, brother. You got to walk away like you're on the expendables. Yep. So... A lot fun. of guys in the chat room are still rolling in here and they're all using the word actually now. Really appreciate you, Jack Wagons, and the things that you are currently saying on here. Really do appreciate that. All right, Ryan, there's something we do here. It's moving into, now that this is our third episode, moving into tradition. It's time to flip the script. You can take over the interview. What do you have to ask? Why did you take so long to give us gun gossip? 
Gun gossip was not a plan. A few people know this story. I was uh, upstairs playing on the internet and I, s I happened to see somebody do what I call low hanging fruit. And low hanging fruit is just taken, I mean, just something that's just too easy to make fun of. If you've got a buddy with a lisp, you don't make fun of his list. That's just too easy. Be smarter than that. And there was a jack wagon that called. Uh, a lovely young man, John Hickok, he happens to be 6'9 or 6'10, called him a Sasquatch. Yeah. I ran downstairs and 40 minutes later, we had gun gossip. So maybe the question isn't for me how long I took. Maybe it's that jack wagon that pulled the low-hanging fruit and called a dude who is 6'10 a Sasquatch. That gets me fired up, brother. So it made you mad because they're picking on him or because it was just too easy? It's just too easy. People pick on each other. I'm not mad. It's, 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 yeah. I think it's just too easy. Low hanging fruit is just lame. -o. And I think I mentioned on a couple podcasts ago that if you got a guy named Forrest, you don't mention run Forrest run. I, I met somebody one time named Layla. Now you kids are going to have to look this one up, but in the nineties, there was a time period called the nineties and there was a song called Layla and everybody can sing every word. And you got me on my knees, Layla. And I met a Layla and I waited a year and I asked her finally, I said one day, Hey, tell me this. How, how often do you have people my age and above sing you the song Layla? And she said, every bleeping day of my life, she said, you were the first person in my life not to mention it to me on the first day. So for me, it's low hanging fruit. So that's what I well, We're glad you brought it. Cause I'm, I'm not kidding. I don't have, I love a lot of the other people that are in the comments and the chat here on YouTube, but I actually, 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 actually <laughs> I look forward to seeing gun gossip every week. So I'm glad you brought that to us. So why did you wait so long to get into doing a YouTube channel? If you're a gun guy, is it just you got into guns that recently, or is it that you realized that you had a way of explaining things or you, you wanted an excuse to do something with the guns besides shoot? At the end of 16, I finished up a pretty major project in my life. I mean, it was a big five-year project and really, really huge. And so I knew that season was coming to an end. I, in the uh, November of 2016, I sat down and I watched over 40 hours of, in a month, over 40 hours of Hickok 45. And I just, I mean, I can't get away from it. It's like watching a fire crackle. You got to watch it. So and did I you just, watch any more than that one video? No, <laughs> Yeah, that was a video and a half. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I watched that and I thought, you know, I would really like to do that. And then that Christmas, Santa Claus got me a Glock 43. So I just set up, opened up the laptop, pulled it up. I put the Glock 43 up and started talking about it. I thought, hey, y'all, I could try that in my, in my garage. Right. And so I did it. And here we are. And now I've got Ryan Kleckner in front of me. How exciting yeah. is this? Man, we're so glad you did it. We're so glad you did it. So you're going to be doing more and more content. The, the better feedback you're getting, because you're getting good feedback. Are you going to grow your channel? Or are you going to try and keep it at the same pace for a while? What's your plan? I don't know, Ryan. I think that the, the plan is to have fun. I've got to do things. Now, somebody already said in the chat room that uh, we children, I think he called us juvenile delinquents, need to quit complaining about our age. But at my advanced age, I, you know, I've got that not that many years left. And I just want to do things that are fun and that hold my attention. I can't do everything. Uh, the internet holds my attention. I love the internet. I love gun culture. Now, it's not new to me. I've been around guns literally my entire life. I had guns. I owned guns before I could walk. And I've been around them forever, just never put media with guns. And the plan is, I don't know, Ryan, just have fun. I'm really enjoying gun gossip. A lot of folks seem to be enjoying it. It's turning the needle. People are laughing. And for that, I am thankful. That's awesome. So what are you going to do next? What is the type of shooting, whether it be a type of firearm or a type of sport or activity that you're not good at now that you want to get good at? And then follow-up question, are you going to let us go on that journey with you and see how bad you are at first and see you get better. We lost you a little bit. I think we lost Johnny's audio. How about that? Are we back? You're back. Now? You're there back. We go. Uh, I'm not good at anything right now. I mean, I stink. Like I'm, I am straight up. I mean, compared and, and you know, like to our conversation a little earlier, you got to know what you're good at. Stay in your lane. When I go mm. shoot with my buddies, I'm the best one there. There's no way around it. But when I go shoot with somebody that really knows what they're doing, holy smokes, I, I can point the bad end away from me. And that's about all I can do. 
Now, I, you're not going to believe this. It's going to sound like I am pandering to you, which I am. And because I'm a little starstruck, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for like 45 minutes before this interview. <laughs> just grin and bear it, Ryan. Let me be me. <sighs> but you're not going to believe this. I want to learn distance shooting. I think, I think, I mentioned this on a podcast the other night or on a live recording. I think I'd like to do a mile shot. I've never shot anything a mile. I've never shot anything really. I've never shot over 500 yards. And I think I'd like to try it. Am I going to go on the journey? Golly, I hope so. Yeah. So I'm asking you, and hopefully for other viewers too, that you let us go on that journey with you because I'm going to learn. So I, I believe I learn from every student in every course I teach because uh, I get to see a new way that they get to look at something or something. Oh, you stop should it. Take You're us not going to learn that. anything from me. Good Lord. Oh yeah. I, I can, I can learn what not to do. Right? <laughs> no, that's what I mean. I mean, every class I learned something and it may not be, they taught me a new way to shoot, but they may have taught me a better way to explain something or they may have taught me, Oh, I never knew that that was an assumption. Let me work on, 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 on breaking that. So I, I just, you guys in the comments, back me up here. I think it'd be cool if you decided to take a long range shooting, I will coach you and teach you, but over a period of time, but I want to see you on the range so that we can compare you over time, getting better and getting more competent. I think that we need to see. Well, I absolutely love that idea. I would like to do some distance shooting. All right. I'm going to ask you a question here. You are allegedly an attorney or slash Esquire. I haven't actually seen your credentials. I'm not sure if I buy it, but you're a, uh, an attorney and you do a lecture on constitutional law and you've got a pretty big uh -huh. law career and you've worked with some really, really big organizations. Yep. Let's talk about the common homeowner, maybe the common CC CCW guy. What is something that guys like me, a homeowner, I defend my home. I also CCW. What's something I can do my day-to-day -day life to protect myself, not protect myself physically, mm -hmm. but legally. Ooh, training there too. Uh, I, I might sound like a broken record, but you need to know what the law is in your state. You need to know what you can and can't do. And I think you need to spend some time. Maybe it's training in a course. Maybe it's finding a mentor. Maybe it's talking to somebody or reading books, but you need to figure out what that line is in your brain that you're willing to use lethal force when it's crossed. So when it happens, you don't sit there in a pure panic because legally you can actually get in trouble doing that. By the way, you run out brandishing a gun at somebody, you can now be getting in trouble yourself by assaulting them. So you need to figure out, and hopefully you agree with me on this one, nothing in your house, but your family is worth dying for. And when that line is crossed, how to use lethal force effectively. I feel that way about my cat Kirby. And so he is part of the family, but I agree with you, man. Nothing is worth legal force. It is stuff. I mean, it is absolutely stuff. Now this story is it's, it's an absolute tragedy. I'm not making light of it, but several weeks ago, that was that dad that thought someone was stealing his truck and he ran out in the road yep. and fired into the truck, killed his own son. And that's a separate, that's the worst day of that family's entire life. But part of me is, and I know I'm being an armchair quarterback or a Monday morning quarterback, but part of me is like, dude, that was a truck, man. And it's just stuff. Yeah, it is. And I may not be popular for saying this, but I'll say it anyway, is no matter how much of a bad person, I shouldn't say no matter how much of a bad person, no matter how much of an idiot that that person is, it's still a human life. Now I'm only talking property. I'm not talking people. If I see somebody shooting innocent people without a doubt, I, I will take that person's life, but you're going to have to live with that the rest of your life that you took somebody else's life and you don't know that situation. It's not right, but be careful. We had a situation here in East Tennessee just about two weeks ago. There was a gentleman in the Walmart parking lot and he saw somebody come out with a buggy and that's called a shopping cart for you Northerners. And there were no bags in it. It was just product. And so he went over and was going and uh, confronted the guy over what it wasn't even his stuff, went over and confronted them, got into a shootout with them over Walmart stuff. People are protective of their own stuff. I've never heard of somebody pulling a gun to protect Walmart. It's unbelievable. All right. Let me yeah. ask you this, Ryan, who has influenced your career? Wow. Too good of a question. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, Larry Keene has a lot. He was the, uh, he's the vice president general counsel at the national shooting sports foundation. And I got a job for him while I was in law school and just seeing what he's done in the career has, has really inspired me. I've wanted to follow that. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. Good question. Who have you not got to meet that you want to meet in the gun industry? Well, it, this morning it was you. So now I can cross that <laughs> off my list. Stop. Um, I, I don't think I'm actually at the spot now. I've just been in the industry enough for enough years and enough of the, I think I've met everyone that I wanted to meet. No offense to everyone on there. I'm not saying that I don't want to meet you guys. I just mean there's not a list of someone I've been dying to, to say hello to. I actually got to see Hickok 45 out at the range day, 
And yeah, I, I feel semi tall until I'm around him. Who is the most overrated gun channel out there? He who shall not be named. <laughs> Very nice. That's yeah. That, I think that's going to be the answer. I like that. I really like that question. And uh, the last time we asked that to Mark from Fit and Fire, that was his answer. I, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what's some myths that people may when they look at you? You know, and again, I wasn't in the military. So, and, and I know it, I know that you're going to say, well, it was just, you know, sitting in a field somewhere, eating MREs, getting sweaty and being miserable when you were in the special forces. But Ryan, you're in the freaking special forces. So just, uh, I, I know it, I know it, I get it. But me look. looking in, what is something that maybe I didn't get as growing up and I've never had that sort of training. What is something that you can take from the military career over to pizza box dads that we need to learn that I didn't get during those years of my life? Well, good question. Uh, one of the things I'm going to, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask about the military is I wasn't in special forces. So special forces is the green berets. Special operations is what they all belong to. Okay. So seals, Delta Rangers, all those belongs. Just, but you got a uniform. Well, yes. I just don't want people to think I'm claiming one thing versus another, but well, I have so, no idea what I'm talking about. The only right. uniform I ever had was the high school marching band uniform circa 91. Nice. <laughs> and you still wear it. That's great. The thing that I took away from the military, and by the way, I'm, I'm so happy I went, I, I would not be who I am today. Uh, had I not gone was learning that your wall and whatever you're doing, your, what you think your limit, your mental or physical wall is actually a lot further out than you realize it is. So it was one of those things where you don't think you can take another step with a ridiculous pack on your back. And you've been walking since the sun went down and now the sun's coming up and you can't move it. You your leg can't go one more step, but then it does. You go, wow, I'm at my wall. I can't do a single more, another step. And then you do it and it does. And all you're doing is you're actually just pushing back that wall every single step you take. And so next time you know that it's a lot further away, that mentally and physically was probably the best thing I learned for the military. When you answered the question, uh, who has influenced you? And you mentioned Larry King. I thought that you said Larry King and people in the, the chat room are saying the same thing. I was going to be so happy if Ryan Kleckner's number one influence was, <laughs> was a little Jewish guy with suspenders. That would have been a really, really good answer if it had been Larry King. Oh, you caught me off guard on that one. I should have said that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, dispel any myths? People see that you are a firearms industry executive, that you're a best-selling author, and that you are a an attorney. And I don't want to limit you. I don't know what all you have done in legal practice, but you do know a lot about gun law. What is something that people come to you? Do people try to get legal advice at the Walmart from you? All the time. And I try to remind people that they get what they pay for. So <laughs> they want the free advice, they'll get, they'll get what's worth that. No, it's what you should know about me as an attorney is I'm not the person to call when you have a DUI. I'm a firearms compliance attorney. I do import exports. I fight with the ATF. I help FFLs and things like that. And yeah, I have a basic legal background from going to law school, but I would go get my own attorney for sure. If I needed one in the self-defense situation or something like that. Um, misnomers. I think that people think about all the time is that one that either everybody in the military is some special operations Rambo or that two, that you have to be some sort of special operations Rambo to be of important. And that's not the case at all. I mean, any guys I worked with and guys that I know that are still in there, guys that are Delta, there's SEALs, there were Rangers out there. None of us, very few of us, look like Rambo. I mean, when we were in the best shape of our lives, we looked like triathletes, not bodybuilders. So I think that's a big misnomer people have too. Where can people find you? RyanCollector.com is probably the easiest way. I need to fix that website and get a little nicer, but I just have so many things going on. That's the one hub I send people and it tries to send them everywhere else. Or they tune into the legal firearms podcast called Trigger Words. I'd appreciate it. We're going ballistic where I just talk about long range shooting and guns in general. I'd appreciate it. Well, when it's time for you to have a secretary, please sign me up because I want to do some of that fun stuff that you get to do. Our guest today is Ryan Kleckner. Ryan, I'm going to give you the final word and then we'll say bye here in just a moment. What do you got to say at the end? Go get training, not only in safety, but how to get better with guns and spend your money there. You'll be way more thankful and better off later. Thanks. To Ryan Clayton, I say a big thank you to everybody that is in the chat room. Thank you guys so much. Love you. Mean it. This has been Zero Prep Gun Fun. We will see you down the road. Thank you all so much. Bye.